Welcome to the New Church Podcast. Okay, so how are people of faith, people who believe in Jesus, how are we supposed to deal with all this outside pressure to compromise what we believe? How does God expect us to handle the constant bombardment of bad news, sickness, frustration, suffering, evil, and pain this life throws at us? What's the point of being a Christian if all this bad stuff's just going to happen to us anyway? You ever have thoughts like that? Like while you're watching the news or when the phone rings late at night? Today we're looking at the book of Daniel, and I think it was written with these exact kind of questions in mind. In most of the Bible, the chapter divisions are pretty random, but in the book of Daniel, almost every chapter is a standalone short story. It's pretty easy to kind of follow what's happening, although it might not be obvious what it actually means, which is why we're here. In chapter 1, Daniel was captured and taken into exile when he was young, probably a teenager. It was during the first raid on Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And he, they also took a bunch of gold and treasure from the temple, things that were supposed to only be used for worship. This was the same time frame as Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And like I said, when we talked about those guys, Jeremiah is like the reporter in Jerusalem. Ezekiel's like a psychedelic street performer version of a cable news channel, letting the Hebrews know in Babylon what was going on back home. Well, Daniel was one of those exiles. But as we'll find out today, he gives us a glimpse into the palace and what was going on behind the scenes, both with King Nebuchadnezzar and with God in heaven. So we learned that Daniel was taken to Babylon along with all the prominent citizens of Judah. The king had his chief official choose some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility, choose some young men without any physical defects, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language, and the literature of the Babylonians. They would be re-educated for three years so they could serve the king and help him rule these strange new Hebrew immigrants. So Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they were among the chosen. And all their names mean in one way or another, we are worshipers of Yahweh, but they were given new Babylonian names. Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which are all names that have to do with pagan gods. Oh, so your name is Faith? Well, how about if we call you Doubt instead? Christian, huh? Well, we're going to call you Satan. That's pretty much what was going on. And surprisingly, they didn't make a big fuss out of their new names. In Daniel, there's a miracle in every chapter. In chapter 1, young Daniel didn't want to defile himself by eating disgusting Babylonian food. So he asked the chief official if he and his friends could skip the weird food and just eat vegetables and drink water. A very strange request for a teenager. God had already caused the chief official to show favor to Daniel And he's like, I'll get in a lot of trouble if you and your friends get skinny and sick because I only feed you rabbit food. But Daniel talks him into it. He says, look, just give it 10 days. See what happens. Well, God intervenes. And in 10 days, they actually look more healthy than all the guys who were eating the royal food. But this wasn't just about them being picky eaters. See, God had given the Hebrews a strict diet to keep them ceremonially clean for worship. And Daniel didn't want to break any of those rules. It might seem like a petty thing, 
but God rewarded them for their faithfulness. Maybe we should be faithful in the little things, and maybe God would bless us and surprise us in great ways too. This is what it says about their three-year training. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams. They graduated at the top of their class, the highest honors. The king himself noticed them and personally interviewed them. It says, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. Pretty high praise. Chapter 2, Daniel puts his dream superpower to work. Nebuchadnezzar had a bad dream, kept him from sleeping. He brought in his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, astrologers. He brought them in to tell him what he had dreamed and what it meant. Maybe he just woke up with a bad feeling. He couldn't remember the details of the dream. Or maybe he thought if he told them the details of the dream, well, then anybody could just make up a possible meaning. But he said, you tell me what I dreamed and what it meant, or I'll have you all cut into pieces and your house is demolished. He was not a nice man. The astrologers, they said what everyone else was thinking. No one on earth can do what you've asked. No one but the gods could do this. And they're not talking. So the king ordered the execution of all of them. All the wise men of Babylon, including Daniel and his friends. When the commander of the king's guard shows up at Daniel's house, Daniel's like, hey, what's, what's going on here? But apparently God had already given him favor with the chief guard too. So he got permission to go talk to the king and ask for a little more time so that he could interpret that dream for him, which is pretty bold. So he goes back to his house. He tells his roommates, man, we got to pray because God is either going to tell us this dream and what it means or we're going to die. So they prayed. And that, guy, that, that night, God gave Daniel a vision of the dream. So he goes back to the king. And he describes the strange dream in detail. So Daniel says to the king, All right, there was a large statue with a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet made partly of iron and partly of clay. Then a rock's cut out, not by human hands, and thrown from heaven, and it struck the statue on its feet, Smashed them. The whole thing was destroyed. Blown away by the wind. And then that rock that struck the statue, it grows into a huge mountain and it fills the whole earth. That was your weird dream, right, O king? And it was. So now Daniel had to tell him what it meant. He starts with flattery. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. Your kingdom is very impressive. Then he goes on. So the head of gold is you. Now for the bad news. The other four parts of the statue, those are the four kingdoms that are going to come after your kingdom. It's a vision of the future. Now that could have been a dangerous thing to say to a megalomaniacal king who pretty much thinks he was God. But the king gets down from his throne and he bows before Daniel. And he says, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. The pagan king praises the true God. Won't be the last time. You know, maybe we should be bold in speaking the truth gently, respectfully. And maybe God would bless our words in surprising ways. Well, Daniel was promoted ruler over all the wise men of Babylon. He lived in the royal palace 
and he appointed his three friends to be his administrators. He goes from death row to being in charge. Won't be the last time either. Chapter 3 starts off some years later. King Nebuchadnezzar has a giant statue of gold set up where everyone can see it. And I can't help but think this was inspired by his dream. He makes a law. Whenever the royal musicians play his theme song, everyone has to bow down and worship that statue, which is going to be really awkward for the Hebrews who are to have no other gods, that whole first commandment thing. So the band would play and faithful Jews would be the only one standing. The astrologers, probably with hurt feelings about Daniel and his friends being put in charge of them, they went to the king and they complained. Oh, great king, you know how everyone is supposed to worship your statue? Well, the Jews ain't doing it. Not even the ones who were supposed to be enforcing the law. Your administrators, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're ignoring you. Well, the king was furious, of course. He had those three guys brought in, and he gave them one more chance. He said, if you agree to worship my statue when the music plays from now on, then we'll call it good. But if not, I'm going to throw you into the blazing furnace. Their answer to him is amazing. We should take note. Because this should be our answer if we're ever asked to deny our faith or face consequences. This is what they said. We don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. But even if he does not. Well, that didn't go over very well. Nebuchadnezzar fumed. He had the furnace, furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. Had the guys tied up and thrown into the fire. When they opened the top door of the furnace, the flames leaped out and killed the soldiers. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fell into the fire. But even if he does not, the king looks into the side door of the furnace to watch the horrors of men being burned alive. We only threw three men in the fire, right? Yes, your majesty, three. Then why are there four men in there? And why are they walking around like it's no big deal? Why is there a fourth man in the fire who looks like a son of the gods? There was another in the fire. So he shouts for the men to come out of the furnace, and everyone's astonished. The three men are unharmed. Their clothes, their hair, they didn't even smell like smoke. The pagan king, who had just ordered the execution of three guys for not worshiping his golden statue, this is what he says. It's remarkable. He says, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything, anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses turned into pile of rubble. For no other god can save in this way. Maybe amazing things will happen if we're faithful. Chapter 4 jumps ahead several years again. Nebuchadnezzar has another perplexing dream. This time, he remembers the dream. 
calls his wise men to tell him what it means. They can't do it. So Daniel shows up and the king tells him about this new dream. Well, in the dream, there was an enormous tree. It was strong and its top reached the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. It was beautiful and it gave fruit to feed all the creatures of the earth. But then a holy one, a messenger, comes down from heaven, orders the tree to be cut down. Only the stump and roots bound with iron and bronze would remain in the ground. And the messenger says, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live like the animals. Let his mind be changed to the mind of an animal until seven times pass by for him. So what does it mean, Daniel? What does my dream mean? Well, Daniel doesn't want to answer. He's quiet for a bit. King's like, go ahead, don't be afraid, just spit it out. So Daniel says, well, I wish the dream was about your enemies, because it's not good. The tree is you, O king. You've grown great and powerful. Your dominion, it reaches to the distant parts of the earth. But you've also been merciless and cruel. And God is telling you to humble yourself or he's going to humble you by making you live like a wild animal. The dream means you need to stop being a jerk and start showing kindness to the people you're oppressing. If you do, your prosperity will continue. If you don't, I hope you like the taste of grass. We're not told how the king responded. But a year later, he's standing on the roof of his royal palace, pretty much thinking about how awesome he is, how powerful and glorious his kingdom is. And then it happened. A voice came from heaven. You were warned. Immediately, he's transformed into a beast. Not exactly a werewolf. More like a were cow with feathers and bird feet. He's driven away from people. He lives in the wild and he eats grass. He's drenched with the dew of heaven. I don't know how long seven times is, but it seems to be a while. The number seven represents completeness in the Bible. So it was a complete time. Maybe seven years, maybe seven seasons. It was seven somethings. But then one day, he comes to his senses. He raises his eyes towards heaven, and he humbles himself, and he praises God. Seems to live the rest of his days as a true believer. I mean, wouldn't you? Chapter 5, another time jump. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's son is on the throne. He's throwing a big, wild party. He's drinking from those golden goblets that were taken from the temple from Jerusalem when it was sacked. They're making toast to their pagan gods. They're having a really nice time. Now, if the were cow wasn't scary enough for you, this next part should make up for it. Because suddenly, a disembodied human hand appears in the room and writes a message on the wall. Everyone in the room turns pale. They're terrified. They can't read what it says. I mean, maybe God has handwriting like a doctor. I don't know. But you know what happens next. The king brings in his wise men, but they can't read it. So the queen reminds the king about Daniel, who can solve these kind of mysteries. So they go get Daniel. They bring him in. And they promise to give him a purple robe and a gold chain and make him the third highest ranking person in the kingdom if he can read the writing on the wall. Daniel says the king can keep his gifts, give the rewards to someone else. But he pulls no punches in speaking to King Belshazzar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar. You know, God made your dad a great king with a mighty kingdom. But he was proud and cruel. So God stripped him of everything, made him live like an animal until he humbled himself and acknowledged that God is the true sovereign king over all the earth. You knew all this, 
And you still use the golden goblets of the true God to get drunk and worship your pagan idols. God is not pleased. Here's what he wrote on the wall. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. Meaning, your reign is over. You've been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Daniel got his purple robe and his gold chain anyway, and his rank in the kingdom. You know, maybe we shouldn't be so hesitant to speak the truth. That night, Belshazzar was killed, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom. One more story. Chapter 6 starts off with King Darius in charge. He's appointing new leaders, and Daniel is one of his top three officials. And because Darius was so fond of Daniel, well, the other leaders were jealous. They wanted to find something they could use against him to take him down. But Daniel was above reproach. He was actually a really great guy. They finally realized the only way they were going to get to Daniel was by using the Bible against him. So they set a trap. They knew Daniel prayed three times a day. So they went to the king and they said, Oh, great king, we think you should issue a decree that anyone who prays to any god other than you should be fed to the lions. And Darius thinks this sounds like a great idea. The danger of yes men and the pride of kings. So the decree was made. No praying for 30 days, which wouldn't even be a challenge for most of us, would it? Well, Daniel, he heard about the decree. He went home, and in front of an open window that faced Jerusalem, just like he always did, he prayed three times a day. You know, God tells us to honor and obey the authorities that he puts over us, unless they tell us to sin. And it would have been a sin for Daniel to stop praying. Well, the jealous leaders, they tattle to King Darius. Hey, you know that law about not praying? Well, Daniel's praying anyway. And Darius is bummed. He likes Daniel, but he's trapped because a king couldn't go back on his decrees. So as Daniel is being thrown into the pit with the lions, the king says, I really hope that God you insist on serving rescues you. And that night, the king couldn't sleep. The next morning, he goes to the lion's den. Daniel, did your God save you? And Daniel answers, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. The stone is rolled away. Daniel is lifted out of the den. The king has the men who set the whole thing up thrown in, along with their wives and their children. Yikes. The hungry lions rip them apart before they even reach the floor. Daniel didn't even have a scratch on him. King Darius issues a new decree that in every part of the kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. Maybe people are watching to see how faithful we're going to be. Maybe little things like praying and going to church regularly. Maybe those things will make a big difference in the world. Even when they try to use the Bible against us. Well, Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and also King Cyrus, who came after him. Cyrus was the ruler who allows the exiles to return to Judea. So the book of Daniel is a chiasm. A lot of the Bible is written as a chiasm. You probably don't know what that is. They don't really make sense to us Western, linear-thinking, modern people. But something that's written as a chiasm... It puts the main point in the middle, not at the end. 
A chiasm works like this. One, two, three, main point. Three, two, one. Well, the central point of the book of Daniel happens in chapter 7. So what is the main point of Daniel? You're going to be really surprised. His initials are J.C. In chapter 7, Daniel, the interpreter of dreams, he starts to have his own visions. The rest of the book is a bunch of his weird apocalyptic descriptions of strange animals with horns and they're attacking and fighting each other. But here's what happens in chapter 7 that is the main point of the book of Daniel. Verse 9, as I looked, thrones were set in place and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. So this is heaven. There are thrones, two thrones. The Ancient of Days is God the Father. Daniel continues, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. It will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Son of man, coming with the clouds, going to the throne room of heaven, into the presence of the Ancient of Days... See, this is Jesus returning from his mission on earth where he lived, died on a cross, and came back from the dead. He established his new kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. This is happening during Acts chapter 1. The disciples are still looking up at the clouds, wondering what just happened. And on the other side of those clouds... God the Father is giving God the Son all authority, glory, and sovereign power over all the nations and people of the earth. This is the point of the dream with the statue of head of gold. Jesus is the rock who was thrown from heaven that destroyed it. Jesus was the fourth man in the fire. Jesus was the one who shut the mouths of the lions. The kingdoms of this world are temporary. The kingdom of God will never end. Daniel wanted the people to know that the Messiah was coming to give them hope. I want all of us to know that he's coming again. It doesn't matter how bad things get in this world, and they will get bad. Jesus has been given all authority and power. This is the message of Daniel. It's a message of hope. It should fill us with courage to stand up, to not compromise, to be people of integrity. See, you, like Daniel and his friends, you are also highly favored. The God you serve is able to deliver you from any trouble in this life. But even if he doesn't, he will deliver you in the life that is to come. Next week, we're going to talk about those freaky visions that make up the rest of Daniel. It's going to get apocalyptic. Let's pray. Father in heaven, man, what a fun book. Thank you for all those stories of courage and no compromise and integrity. Thank you for all of those glimpses into your kingdom that came with Christ. That we are living out in this Babylon. Fill us with courage and resolve to be faithful in the little things and the big things, and to speak up when it's our time to speak up. 
thank you for the message that you've given us to give to the world of grace and hope. Amen. For more information, go to newchurch.love or email frank at frankheart.com. If these online resources have been meaningful to you, please consider going to newchurch.love slash give and show your support by helping make this ministry possible. Thank you.